ear. We are asking, Lord, that tonight you reach every life in your word in Jesus' name. Use us to establish the church and use us to be a blessing to everyone around us. And we pray that your blessings also will pop on every one of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. I want to recognize all our workers, all our leaders who are here. And I want to tell you that God recognizes you. And we appreciate your coming. And the Lord will bless you tremendously in Jesus' name. Or I've mentioned, uh, you know, each of the sections one by one. But um, never mind. God knows your name. And he knows what you are doing. And the blessings of God will flow through you to the church in Jesus' name. Tonight, we're looking at uh, Colossians, and uh, we're examining something very important, essential, in the epistle of Paul to the Colossians. You will understand that uh, Paul, the apostle himself, had not been in the church to help the church or to plant the church or to teach the church. Other servants of God have been used tremendously to plant this church. And then report had come to him that such a church was there. Although we cannot rule out his influence because Colossae was in Asia Minor. And the Lord had used him to make sure that the gospel spread all through Asia Minor. But Colossae was um, peculiar. It, is what, it was what we call a pluralistic society, pluralistic community. They had been infiltrated as well as influenced by, number one, powers of darkness. Number two, by philosophy, atheistic philosophy and unchristian philosophy. Not only that, by cultural traditions of various types and then by religions anti-christian religions primitive religions and it was judaism of course that had affected the city the community there was false worship and there was uh, what is called asceticism that is neglecting the body neglecting the life and uh, being like uh, stoics the people that don't feel that the body is essential at all and they went into what is called voluntary humility and they had their human dogmas too this do and this don't do and in Kodose there were vices there was a terrible crime and there were contagious uh, things that brought filthiness or sensuality to the community and to that city and yet to know that a Christ-centered church was planted there. That encourages us that whatever the condition of our cities or the condition of our communities, a strong church, a Christ-centered church, and a spirit-filled, spirit-controlled church can still be planted and will be planted there. That's why we're looking at the message tonight, growing a Christ-centered church in every community growing a christ-centered church in every community as we talk about these communities you might uh, look around you and look at the community in which your local church is or in which your district church is and then you say what's this and this and this all around me here all around our local church here can this church grow that church will grow Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 Who has delivered us from the power of darkness And has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son Those people were converted from the background of the powers of darkness Occultism was there And many of them had been influenced and infiltrated by that But all the same, they were still converted and the church was there. In Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 8. In verse 8, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through uh, philosophy and 
vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ what does that tell us it tells us that that city had been influenced by philosophy and by vain deceit and also by the teachings or traditions of men and then by the rudiments the rudiments of the world and yet the church was there it's telling us that we shouldn't give any excuse that the church here is not growing the church here is not vibrant and the church here cannot be strong because we are kind of opposed and attacked by all these things around us look at verse 16 and look at uh, what happened in that city in verse 16 of chapter 3 let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the sabbath that tells you about a judaism being there very much pronounced and all the do's and don'ts and their uh, sabbatical observances and it says that they which i shadow of things said to come but the body is of christ that is the people were still holding on to the shadows and they were very very serious about that if you have met any of these people in your community you'll find that they're fanatical and they will defend uh, all those uh, rules and regulations and rituals and ceremonies they may even defend that with their very lives look at verse 18 it says let no man beguile you let no man deceive you let no man distract your attention from the real sin let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and the worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up uh, to his uh, fleshly by his fleshly mind that is the people were even proud of their error they were proud of their dogmas and they were proud of the erroneous things they were carried about and they were also forthright and they were challenging everybody that's why paul the apostle said they'll come to you they'll get to you just be a forceful and a ferocious and you will not allow them to confuse you very difficult to evangelize in such a place very difficult to evangelize when the people themselves they're getting at you and they're getting to you they want to evangelize you while you are trying to evangelize them and if you are a kind of a timid laid-back person that is uh, easily frightened by the aggressiveness of those people you'll not be able to do anything but the church over there was strong and the church was vibrant and the church uh, they were outgoing and that's what we are going to be that no matter the condition of the people no matter the religion no matter the tradition around you there you will still preach the word without any fear of anyone look at verse 21 it says in verse 21 touch not and taste not and uh, handle not and that's still part of the concept of the people because they had this asceticism that is they denied them so if you are talking of uh, you know being disciplined and being determined and being diligent you know these were the people uh, they say, i don't eat this i don't drink this i don't touch this i don't go that way and uh, you know these people you now want to preach to them they say what do you want to tell me and what will christ do what more will christ do in my life already without having christ look at how strong i am strong willed people and strong minded people that can deny themselves to the point of even uh, damaging their own very lives and here you are preaching the gospel to and say i'm in control i control my mind i control my body i control my desire i control everything i'm the master of my life and the master of my faith and you want to bring jesus to them that will now redeem them that will change their lives and they will give them the real control that ought to, they ought to have in their lives and all these oppositions were there and yet there's a great church there it's an encouraging thing for us our church will be strong militant and vibrant that whatever the ideology around you there whatever it is that these uh, people that elevate tradition and religion and ceremonies whatever it is they do with their cultism we're going to plant a strong church in every community 
growing a Christ centered church in your own community. And you will do it. I said you will do it. I come to Colossians chapter 1 and let us see the kind of church that was there. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timotheus, our brother. And he says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Of all places, the saints at Colossae. The faithful brethren at Colossae. Grace be unto you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. And you will see the reason why the church was strong. While the church was spiritual, while the church there was vibrant, it says in verse 7, As ye also learnt of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. I learned something there. The very fact that Paul the Apostle was not there to minister to them directly does not mean that uh, the church cannot be strong. That, uh, you know, a, a well-known pastor is not there in your local church does not mean that that local church cannot be strong because you are the Epaphras in that local church. And you'll be strong. And you'll be courageous. And what God did through this Epaphras in Colossae, he will do through you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 28, whom we preach. We now, he's talking of uh, Paul, the apostle himself, and Epaphras, whom we preach, we're preaching together, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. When many things and philosophies are militating against your teaching, you are thinking and you are saying, will I be able to perfect the people? Can I mature the people? Can I grow the people? Can I strengthen the people? Look at all the things that are coming against the teaching. We teach them on Sunday and then during the week our members have to go and face all these things. Yes, all that we do and whatever we're doing will be stronger and greater than those things. The world is coming at them in Jesus' name. Upon this rock, I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against our church. We preach, warning every man. We preach, teaching every man. That we may present everyone perfect in Christ Jesus chapter 2 of Colossians for you to understand why that church was what it was it says in chapter 2 verse 6 as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord so walk ye in him and the preachers who preached to the people at Colossae they presented Christ in fullness they presented Christ in his demand and the people understood who Christ was, the Savior, their substitute, their sanctifier, their sufficiency, and they received him in totality. Don't miss words and don't make any mistake to lower, to minimize what you are saying about Christ. That's how to grow the church. You come to the church and you tell them this is who Christ is. There's no salvation in any other. This is the Savior. And this is our substitute. And this is the final sacrifice. And it's a sufficiency. All the need they will find in Christ. And Paul the Apostle said, You have received Christ Jesus. Now so walk in Him. Look at verse 7. Rooted and built up in Him. And established also in the faith. So as ye have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving paul the apostle was sure these people were taught they were taught we shouldn't uh, just you know just preach and just say things and uh, just uh, make people worship and get alive they were taught with all the confusion around 
and with all the philosophies around we cannot afford to just waste the times of our, the time of our members when they come to the church we must teach them and then we must have the confidence as you have been taught the power of god go through the teaching and as you go back home you'll be victorious in jesus name look at verse 9 for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's what they touched those people. They told the people, touched the people, emphasized to the people, you don't need any other sin outside Christ. It's everything you need. Because in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness. If we teach with confidence in our churches, and the people know Christ and Christ is exalted and Christ is uh, presented in full that the people know thank God whatever I'm going through thank God whatever challenges I have Christ is sufficient and they will know in your personal life that even for yourself the pastor for yourself the leader that Christ is sufficient and thank God because you are strong in Christ and your faith is strong in Christ. That same faith, that same experience you have in Christ, you transfer to the people. And the Lord will support you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 10. And ye are complete in him. That's what they were taught. That's why the church there was strong and vibrant. Ye are complete in him. It means that, uh, you know, you are not telling them, well, we are preaching Christ, we are teaching the word of God, but that area, I don't know whether Christ will be involved in that. That area, I don't know whether Christ will solve that. You are telling them Christ is all in all. All I need, I find in Jesus. He satisfies and joy he supplies. Life will be worthless without him. All that I need, I find in Jesus. When you teach confidently like that, and they know that you are not going to one corner somewhere, they don't meet you in any place where they say, ah, Pastor, what are you doing here? Well, heaven helps those who help themselves. I too have some challenges that I couldn't solve with the Bible promises. That's why I came here. You're going to lose your ministry. Whatever it is, you stay with Christ. You abide in Christ, and that problem will be solved. Even tonight, that problem will be solved in Jesus' name. Because it says, and ye are complete in him. I am complete in him. I said, I am complete in him. It says, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and powers. And look at chapter 3. In chapter 3, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, you see these uh, people at Colossae, they were so taught the word of God that Paul the apostle was saying, I've had testimonies about you, and I'm so happy. And now that you know, like I know, that you have been risen, you have been, you have, uh, you have been risen with Christ, it says, Seek those things which are above where christ seated on the right hand of god set your affections on things above not on things on the earth you see as we're teaching the church you make the church today more heavenly minded than they were yesterday but you know if you are teaching the people and you're talking too much of earthly things earthly matters you're talking too much about you know the economy and the politics and you know this is going on that is going on and you are picking all these things that you hear they can hear that on the street but then they come and when they come to the church you are so much emphasizing things that are spiritual that their affection their attention their desires their aspiration centered on things above rather than on things on the earth because you are preparing them for the rapture and they will make it in jesus name for ye are dead and your life is seed with christ in god uh, you understand why paul the apostle is emphasizing this they live in a community where they are parts of darkness although they have been delivered and brought out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son the trials might still come 
and those occultic powers might still knock at the door but then paul the apostle assured them he said i'm sure you have nothing to fear because you are dead the one they can touch and the one they could hurt that one was already dead and there's no evil power that is running after somebody is already dead and now your life your new life is hid with christ in god you are totally protected even those of us who are here you are protected in jesus name because your life is totally completely in christ and you see in god then he says for when christ who is our life shall appear then shall ye also appear with him in glory and thank god you'll be there somebody there said you'll be there colossians chapter 4 colossians chapter 4 look at verse 2 continue in prayer you know that why that church was strong they were praying a prayerful church they were inter an interceding church that's why they were strong and it says i know you are doing it, but continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving where were thou uh, praying also for us that god will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of christ for which i also am in bonds that i may make it manifest as i ought to speak and then he goes on and tells them in verse 6 let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man there were argumentative people in Colossae. There were people that will argue on religion from night, from morning till night. There were people that will argue on philosophy and science, possibly so called, at Colossae. And so Paul the Apostle said, Don't run away from them, don't avoid them. Just know how you will answer every man. Well, you will see from what you have read that that was a vibrant church, that was a real standing church. And our church will be like that in Jesus' name. How do we then do that? How did it do that? How do we do that to grow a Christ-centered church in your community? Because it will be done. Three things. Number one, the comprehension of fervent servanthood. The comprehension of fervent servanthood. That you, as a servant of God, am I talking to servants of God there? A brother, a sister, you're a servant of God. That you as a servant of God, you will know what servanthood means. And you will know what is fervent servanthood. And because of that fervency in your servanthood and in your service and ministry, then you're able to help the church to be what it ought to be. Number two, the consecration of faithful saints. The consecration of faithful saints. You see, if we, we have the servants of God, and then we have the saints in the church. If the saints in the church will leave everything to the servant of God, so that it's like the servants of God, they are, they are full-time people, they are paid people, that's their special service. And we saints, members of the church, are just to fold our hands and just to stay there. And then we come in on Sunday and we hear the word of God and then go back home and do nothing. That's not how to grow a strong church. But it's when the servants know what it means to be fervent. And when the saints know what it means to be faithful. And so you have the consecration of faithful saints. Number three, their concentration on focused soul winning. Their concentration on focused soul winning. We're coming to number one. Tell me number one. The comprehension of fervent servanthood. And brothers and sisters, please, we uh, come to all these leaders' meetings, not just to hear the word of God. Wonderful to hear. We will be doers of the word. Because you know, I, I think you ought to know, God can make an epaphras out of you somebody that will say by the grace of god i came to the leaders meeting 
and this is what I heard and those things I heard they were transferred into my lives I used to be like a pygmy but now I am a champion and the Lord will make champions out of you out of every one of us in Jesus name if you had been timid and fearful before strength will come into you power will come into you you will be fruitful am I talking to somebody what's the person I'm talking to there you'll be fruitful in Jesus name the comprehension of fervent servanthood let's look at Colossians chapter 1 Colossians chapter 1 and here we're reading from verse 7 it says as ye have learned this person I've been teaching them as ye have learned of Epaphras that is Epaphras have been the teacher teaching them the word of God as ye have learned of Epaphras our dear fellow servant who is for you a faithful minister of Christ who is for you a faithful minister of Christ learn that about about Epaphras and write that down about yourself you'll be a fellow servant if all the apostles were to be here today, he'll not be looking at you as a junior worker. He'll not be looking at you as a worker down below there. He'll not be looking at you as somebody who cannot bear the same fruit and produce the same fruit that he has produced. He'll be referring to you as a fellow servant because you are called into the ministry and you are called into service. And he knew he was what he was by the grace of God. And that same grace of God will work in your life. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 7. Colossians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 7. All our state shall take a cause, declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. You see, Epaphras was there in that church, the church at Colossae. And Tychicus was also there in that church at Colossae. Would you see that there was no competition among them? Would you see that there was no quarrel among them? Would you see there wasn't any pushing away between them? Epaphras, Paul the Apostle wrote about him. And he said, he's a fellow servant. And he's your servant. And he's your minister. And also Tychicus, in that same church, he said, Tychicus is also there. He's a beloved brother and a faithful minister. And then he called him a fellow servant. You see, in a, a local church, like our district church, like our group, like the old group, like a state, like a region, we have many ministers there and each one has his place and each one can be faithful and we don't need to compete with each other the women have their ministry and the youth the leaders have their ministry and the children workers and leaders have their ministries and our ushers and secretaries they have their ministry our singers and the musicians have their ministry everybody has the ministry the pastors too they have their ministries the language section and the you know english section we have our ministries and we can all serve the lord acceptably and while he is in this part of ministry i'm helping him i'm lifting his hand up i'm encouraging him and if uh, somebody has come to me for counseling and uh, he still needs more counseling and then goes to the other person for counseling and i'm passing by and i see him i'm not wondering what's he doing there i thought you came to me last week after you come to me for counseling, what are you going to do again with, uh, you know, Pastor so-and-so? Am I not competent? No, because as you have done your part, and part of the problem has been solved, he is still needs some help, and is gone to the other person. There's no competition. We are fellow servants together. I thought somebody will say, Amen. <laughs> You see, when we're not fighting each other, we're just doing the work together, and as we're lifting up the same load, and they we're lifting up everything together, that's how the work will grow. 
because they, they were not were throwing stones at anybody and were not opposing anybody criticizing anyone were fellow servants together look at verse 8 over here in verse 8 he's still talking about this uh, taiki cost now he's speaking about epaphras and he's speaking about a taiki cost whom i have sent unto you paul apostle why are you sending a turkey cause? I thought you have sent me a paraphrase. Am I not competent? It is sometimes, you know, uh, there are people that think that we only have uh, one leader in a particular place. And so since that person is there, this other person we are sending out, what's he going to do that I cannot do? Maybe you can do everything, but you know, two are better than one. And as you live and let others live, you walk and let others walk, you counsel and let others counsel, you teach and let others teach, you pray and you let others pray. As we do the work together, I'm telling you, you are going to experience some growth you have never experienced before in Jesus' name. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose. That he might that he that he might know your estate and comfort your heart. Uh -huh. We we'll come to another one now. This uh, church was blessed by faithful ministers. Look at verse nine with Onesimus. Tell me what follows. A faithful and beloved brother. You see, all the leaders we can get, we're going to make use of them. I said we're going to make use of them. I was, uh, you know, really impressed uh, last uh, Sunday. Uh, we had the revival in the evening. And the brother who led the prayer, he was from the children's section. I said, this, uh, you know, people, that was Oshodi. And uh, it's like, uh, we're not so okay, that's children's section. What had they got to do in a meeting like this? This is for adults. All the other people are to just come and watch because we are the people. Well, we are all the people. And we're going to do the work together. And as we do the work together, and we involve the youth leaders and the children leaders and the choir leaders and the ushers and the security and everybody, and then we unite together in unity, there is strength. And look at this in verse 9 with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known. Not just he. They shall make known, is the plurality of leadership there. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. We're going to succeed. Now we come to our first man, verse 12, Epaphras. Give me the name, everybody. Epaphras. And you know, Paul the Apostle is wonderful. All these revelations we're having, Epaphras is there, Tychicus is there, Onesimus is there. Now, I've not finished talking, speaking about Epaphras. I want to talk to you about him now. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Always laboring, tell me the word, fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. You can see the focus of these servants. They actually understood what servanthood meant. And they were doing the work in such a way that that church will be perfected and that church will be strengthened. Let's come back to Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. Whom we preach. Now you understand that word we. Paul the apostle preaching. Epaphras preaching, Tychicus preaching, Onesimus preaching, all the servants of the Lord available to grow that church, everyone preaching, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we, not just me, you see that, we understand that what God is doing in every local church and all our church together. Like even tonight now, it's not just the person standing on the pulpit that is doing the work. We're all doing it together. And it said that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. It will be done in Jesus' name. And we're looking at, uh, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. 
Ephesians chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 11 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 here is uh, what is telling us of the plurality of leadership in the church that is the the various leaders available and nobody hinders the other everyone is helping the other part it says and he gives some Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers all of them working together for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come everyone till all the saints come till all the people of God come till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ it will be done in your local church it will be done in your district church it will be done in that region in that state in that country it will be done in jesus name but understand that brother there's something to contribute that you may not be able to contribute understand that sister there has something to contribute to the work for the perfecting of the saints that you may not be able to contribute of course you too you have something to contribute that others may not be able to contribute it is as to work together and you're having the same goal and the same purpose together we're going to have a strong church in your locality there in jesus name it says in verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive the lord is telling us that we can do this work and we're going to do it together and we'll be fervent in spirit doing the work of the lord in jesus name Epaphras and these other ministers in the church understood servanthood and they rendered sacrificial service. They rendered sacrificial service. You see, you do the work and you sweat a little. You do the work to the point you might even be exhausted. You do the work and then you say a little bit more, a little bit more. And whatever the condition in our communities, we keep on doing the work. Number one, these people who were fervent, they were also faithful. We've read those references and it says this one is faithful, that one is fervent. Not only that, they were selfless, selfless. They were not thinking of themselves alone. What can I do that will help the church? What can I do that will encourage that brother? What can I do that will lift up that sister? What can I do that will strengthen the hand of my fellow servant and fellow preacher? Not to number two, they were self-denying, self-denying. You see, brothers and sisters, self-denial is not just that well. By the grace of God, temptation came, I denied myself. That's wonderful. And I don't want to take anything out of that. But you know, sometimes self-denial, you see something about a brother. And there's something in your heart wanting you to talk. And then self-denial is, no, I'll deny myself. Because if I talk, I might feel happy. If I talk, I release nothing out of my heart. I feel happy, he feels unhappy. I feel strong. If I can say that thing, and I can say it right to your face, I feel I am bold. Yes, but I'm bold, but I intimidate him. And he feels small. And he feels incompetent. And he feels incapable. Self-denial is we're working together. And I cannot afford to discourage him. We're working together. I cannot afford to discourage her. Because if I discourage him, I discourage him, I discourage her. And then I'm left alone, a lone ranger in the work. How do we get the work done? Self-denial. They denied themselves. I don't mind that Paul the Apostle is writing about Tychicus. 
I don't mind that Paul the apostle is mentioned the name of Onesimus. I don't mind. It believes me. I'm still standing there. And okay, you're still there, Epaphras. I want to talk to you about Epaphras now in chapter 4, verse 12. He's also a faithful brother and he's laboring for you and he wants the best for you. Let's understand how to deny ourselves in helping other people. How to deny ourselves is not everything we know to say that we're saying. It's not everything we know to push that we push. It's not everything we know to, you know, we can walk fast and we can, you know, just, just do anything and we're courageous and we're firm. But if my courage will discourage that person, if my courage will make that person timid and be shivering, I think I need to you know, deny myself and cut down a little bit on my posture so that my brother will have a space to move and my sister will have a space to do the work self-denying. And they were Christ-centered. They were Christ-centered like Paul the Apostle and they preached fervently and they prayed fervently and they ministered earnestly to evangelize the city and then these brethren they were committed to soul winning and they established the saints and the doctrine of christ to prepare and to perfect the church for the coming of christ we we'll come to number two now point number two the consecration of faithful saints the consecration of faithful saints. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. Colossians chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 2. It says in verse 2, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. Brothers and sisters, pastors alone don't make up the church. We need the pastors. We need the people. Brothers and sisters, servants of God alone do not make up the church. We need the servants of God. We need the saints of God. And Moses alone did not make up Israel, the nation of Israel. We need, we needed Moses. We needed all those tribes of the children of Israel. David alone did not make up the kingdom. But we have David, we have the valiant men. Let's always think about that. It's good we have servants who are fervent and servants who are faithful. We need saints who are faithful. What if you came to church on Sunday and then you are punctual, you are there and then you are watching all the, you know, preachers are there, Sunday school teacher, there, everybody there, but even the choir, everybody there. But the people we are singing to, they are not there. And the people were preaching to, they are not there. And the people who want to encourage, they are not there. Then you understand, we need those saints as well. Appreciate it when they come. Appreciate it when they are there. And Paul the apostle, yes, he wrote about the servants, but now he's writing also to the saints. Relax and understand that without those people there, you don't have a ministry. It's not enough to just say, I have the word and I have, you know, the message and I'm going to preach today. Those weak people and those uh, so-called small people and those uh, people that might have some challenges in their lives, they are the people that give you ministry. They are the people that give you a chance to manifest whatever gift and whatever talent you have. Therefore, we're thinking about the servants of God. We're thinking about the saints of God. That's why their place, the congregation is very important. And we're talking about the consecration of faithful saints and already i've read that verse two to you and let's look at this word saint saint uh, we're looking at uh, psalm 50 and i'm reading here from verse 5 psalm 50 verse 5 here is the lord talking uh, to through the psalmist he says gather my saints together unto me 
that's why they gather together and on sunday we come together monday we come together and um, other days we come together too because god wants all those saints to gather together not only the servants all those saints to gather together gather my saints together unto me those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice through the sacrifice of jesus christ has come to the new testament that he died for us on the cross of calvary and because he died for us they have made covenant with god the covenant of peace they have made a covenant with god and the covenant of following the lord until the rest of their lives because of the sacrifice of christ he says gathered them unto me now he says uh, paul the apostle says that these are saints and their faithful brethren in christ our members are walking in various places our members are living in various places our members are involved and they're interacting with various people and in our teaching in our encouraging them in our building them discipling them we want to disciple them to the point that they know they must be faithful everywhere they go in everything they are doing because it is out of these people god will raise up other servants you know first of all we are members and later we become ministers and if we could be faithful while we are members then it will not be difficult when we become ministers to become to remain faithful we're looking at first samuel chapter 2 first samuel chapter 2 we're reading from verse 35 the concept of faithfulness it says in first samuel chapter 2 verse 35 and i will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind what's faithfulness faithfulness is doing according to what's in the heart of god what's in the mind of god not doing my own will not going my own way not saying that's that's the best i can do not saying that's the way i see it not saying that's that's who i am not saying well if you are not satisfied with that it's a pity because uh, that's just me i don't want to pretend no faithful people they're the people that look at the mind of christ and the heart of christ and the desire of the lord and that's what we're teaching them we're showing them what's the will of god what's the desire of god we're showing them what is the request of god and the people who are faithful they are saved they're sanctified and they are yielded totally to the lord they're the people who will do according to that which is in his heart according to that which is in his mind we're looking at second kings chapter 12 faithfulness second kings chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 15 second kings chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 15 in verse 15 it says wherefore uh, second kings second kings 12 are you there they are there before me let's look at this second kings chapter 12 verse 15 i'm there now it says moreover they reckon not with the men in whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed in the on the work on workmen for the dealt tell me faithfully faithful you know brothers and sisters the group pastor doesn't have to handle the finance all the time he can he may but he doesn't have to and uh, the region of Asia does not have to handle the finance by himself he may no problem and the state of Asia doesn't have to doesn't have to but he may can't we develop people that by the grace of god we have taught them the word of god and you want to put things in their hands and make them responsible and 
and then when we come to audit or we come to look at anything by the grace of god these are real christians trustworthy christians dependable christians and those will be your members in jesus name that these were faithful the money was committed into their hands and they were to distribute and give and pay the workmen and uh, were not looking over their shoulders whether they are doing this or that they were faithful and that's what the lord expects that we will be faithful and of course since you are faithful by the grace of god in the strength of the lord the people you teach like father like children like mother like children they will be faithful as well in jesus name in second chronicles chapter 19 second chronicles chapter 19 and we're reading from verse 9 second chronicles chapter 19 we're reading from verse 9 and he charged them saying thus shall ye do in the fear of the lord what's the next word i just wanted to know whether you are there faithfully and with a perfect heart here was uh, the king jehoshaphat and was talking to the people that uh, he had appointed you know just like we said you are a king you need those subjects we need everybody and we need all the citizens in the domain in the dominion and so you are a leader we need all the people and then you are challenging them and you charge them like he did and he says that he do he do everything in the fear of the lord faithfully and with a perfect heart look at verse 10 and what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in their cities is this between blood and blood between law and commandment statute and judgments ye shall even warn them that they tell me trespass not we tell the people we show the people you know as you if you give out responsibility you're going to counsel the people you're going to prepare the people you're going to talk to them it's not that you give out responsibility then you abandon everything no we don't do that you're the leader you're the pastor you're the servant of god and these saints are involved it says over here that you tell them he told them that they trespass not against the lord so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren this do and ye shall not trespass and behold amaziah the chief priest is over you in all matters of the lord and then he mentions another person zabadiah the son of ishmael and he says the ruler of the house of judah for all the king's matters also the levites shall be officers before you tell me now tell me out loud deal courageously and the lord shall be with the good any amen there yeah. brothers and sisters we want your members the saints to be courageous we want your subordinates the people who are working with you to be courageous but look if you are a leader and you talk to your subordinates to intimidate them and to bring a habit of shivering and trembling anytime they see you and you're destroying the very backbone you're destroying the strength of their character because you think if i appear and they are shivering if i appear and they are trembling if i appear and they are timid uh-huh then uh, i am a great leader uh -uh, but you destroy the people who are going to do the work with you just say it let them understand like you want your children in the family when they see you they respect you but they don't have to be afraid 
They respect you and they love you. They don't have to be timid. Daddy is coming. Mommy is coming. The same thing. Build up the lives of the saints and build up the lives of your members and then you rejoice in the fact that when you see your members they're courageous when you see the subordinates the people who are working that one's working in the children's section that one is working women's section that one is working the choir that one is working usher that one is security that other one they're working different places and when you appear like this they love you they respect you but they are not timid, they are not afraid, they are not trembling. Let us try and let us develop all these leaders so that we build up courage in them. They'll be courageous in Jesus' name. And so Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, he knew what he was telling them. He said, when you go and do the work, you are doing this work for the Lord, but be bold and courageous. We gain nothing by making the people who are walking with us and walking along with us, we gain nothing by making them timid and making them kind of uh, powerless. But when they become strong and bold and courageous, that work will be done well in Jesus' name. They did it faithfully. They were courageously faithful. And you will be courageously faithful in Jesus' name. Now, whatever it is you are doing, you are there. And you're not saying that, you know, I'm going to make a mistake. The leader is there. He's going to watch me whether I miss uh, something or mess up or not. No, you will not mess up. Amen. You will not fail. While the leader is there, just be yourself and do what you need to do. If you make a mistake, well, correct you, but be bold and be courageous and do what you want to do. And the Lord will bless you in Jesus' name. And we're looking at uh, Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 13. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 13, it says, And I made treasures over the treasuries and then he mentioned uh, Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and of the Levites then he mentioned Epediah and uh, the next to them was Anan the son of uh, Zachor the son of Mataniah for they were counted tell me faithful and their office was to distribute to the brethren distribute to the brethren you, the leader will not distribute everything by himself whether we're distributing tracts or food or whatever it is or we're distributing other things we have people we can choose there all we want to make sure of is we have trained them to be faithful and they know that they are faithful to god they are faithful to the teaching of the word of god and they are faithful to the calling the lord has given them I pray that this will be our experience in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 101. Psalm 101. I'm reading here from verse 6. Psalm 101, verse 6. In verse 6, it says, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. Mine eyes shall be, tell me, upon the faithful of the land but what does that mean what does that mean here is a king uh, david if you look at the top of the psalm it's a psalm of tell me a psalm of david as a leader as a king he is interested in finding out who are the faithful in the land he says i need more warriors it says I need more fighters. It says I need more singers. It says I need more whatever. And all those people he needed, he knew that I must have faithful people. And therefore he says, I'm always looking out. I'm always looking out. I'm always looking out. If you are ignorant of members of your church, you are not even interested to know their names or to know their ability or to know their training or to know their background or to know about their knowledge or even to just to be interested in them how are you going to have fine faithful people but he said mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me he that walketh in a perfect way he shall serve me 
You see, we will wait too late and too long when we need some workers, and there is then we are conducting interview. And the interviews we are conducting will just be from the head. What is this? They tell us what is that? They tell us you don't know faithfulness from that, but you know them normally, you interact with them normally, you move with them normally, and then you're able to see the faithfulness and the church will become stronger in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. We're reading from verses 3 and 4. Daniel chapter 6. Reading from verses 3 and 4. In verse 3 it says, Then this Daniel, where he was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. An excellent spirit was in him. That's attitude. That's disposition. That's the way you carry yourself. And the way you interact with other people. Excellent spirit found in him. And then it goes on to say, And the king thought to set him over the, the whole realm. Then, the president and the princess sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. That is his employment there, the work there. But they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was, tell me, he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. That means he was transparently faithful. Transparently faithful. In your own life, in your own means, in your work, in your place of work, you are transparently faithful. And in your family, you are transparently faithful. And in the church, whatever is committed to your hand, you are transparently faithful. And it is not when the leader wants to come, you are trying to adjust some things and balance some things and cover up some things. Because from now on, transparency will be the mark of your life in Jesus' name. Number one, the servants were fervent. Number two, the saints were faithful. Number three now, their concentration on focused soul winning. We're coming back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 17. Colossians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 17 and say to Archippus, Look, this is another leader again in at Colossae. Think about that. That this church at Colossae at Epaphras, at Tychicus, at Onesimus, and at this new person, what's his name? Archippus, and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Here was another person, again, another servant over there, and uh, Paul the apostle was saying, help me tell him, help me remind him, help me encourage him, and help me emphasize this to him. Anywhere you see uh, this man, Archippus, don't just uh, discuss generally, 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 uh, just, just remind him be faithful remind him fulfill the ministry that you have received in the lord so that uh, this work will not lag when it says the ministry what ministry have we received in the lord second corinthians chapter five second corinthians chapter five we're reading here from verse uh, 18 second corinthians chapter five we're reading from verse 18 the ministry we have received of the Lord that we concentrate on it until we fulfill it. It says, and all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us, tell me, the ministry of reconciliation. So when he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And we're not going to allow anything to tamper with that. Anything to hinder that. 
it tells us in acts of the apostles paul the apostle himself acts of the apostles uh, paul the apostle was uh, telling people that tell uh, this man Archippus that he must uh, take it to the ministry which he has received of the lord that he will fulfill it he himself was living by example it tells us in acts chapter 20 verse 24 but none of these things move me you not allow things to move you to destabilize you to disturb you to jolt you to discourage you or to derail you you are concentrated as paul the apostle was concentrated that's why he told the people at Colossae, help me tell him help me remind him help me emphasize it to him Archippus, take it to the ministry which you have received of the lord that you fulfill it you'll fulfill your ministry every day you do something to contribute to the progress of that ministry you are reading about that ministry you are learning about that ministry and you are doing that ministry you are contributing something every day little drops of water make a mighty ocean you do this now do this now do this now and the more you do the more the stronger you will be like paul the apostle but none of these things move me neither count time my life dear unto myself what does that mean does that mean i throw my life away I, I will die doesn't matter what happens not that at all when it says neither count i my life dear unto myself what he meant was this life is to be spent profitably for the ministry god has given me and i will not withhold anything i ought to do i will not reserve my strength my life and say i cannot do this now when i know that's my ministry I cannot do that now when I know that's my calling because I'm trying to preserve my life. It says, what am I preserving my life for? I am to spend the life on the ministry and I count the ministry essential and my life will be poured into that ministry. Not that I'm, you know, protecting the ministry, I'm protecting my life and then I'm not able to do what I'm going to do. That's what he, why he meant, what he said. That's what he meant when he said, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that, that's the reason, so that, that's the purpose, so that, that's the goal, so that I might tell me, you will finish this course. I said you'll finish this ministry, so that I might finish my course with joy. That means no regrets, no remorse. Had I known yesterday I would have done this, but now yesterday is gone. Had I known last Sunday I would have done this, but I was looking at this, looking, but now that day is gone. And what can I do now? He said, There'll be no regrets. Every day comes and I say, I'm not going to protect my life to the point I'm not able to do what God has called me to do today. Every day of your life will contribute to your progress. It says that I might finish my course with joy. And then it says, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify, to witness, to preach the gospel of the grace of God. Paul has done his own. And he has gone. Now it's your turn. And you'll be faithful. It's your turn. You'll be fervent. It's your turn. You are going to be fruitful in Jesus' name. That means you put everything you've got into this. Your time, your talent, everything you've got. Push it into the work. And God will use you. As one of the people, one of our leaders, that will build that church in that place. Physically, you'll build the church together spiritually you build the church together and when the time comes to have rewards as the saints are marching in and they mention Epaphras he got his reward and they mention Onesimus 
and he got his reward and then they mention Tychicus and he got his reward here comes Archippus and he got his reward here comes who is the next person there you'll have your reward in Jesus name you'll not miss it so keep strong keep courageous keep faithful the Lord is on your side you will not fail let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer planting a great church growing a wonderful church a strong church in your community there the hand of the Lord is upon you it will be done you will do it any failure of the past repent of that rise up and move on 